Welcome to the seventh Net That Hall Compass show of the 21-22 season. I can't believe we're on seven episodes of this before game week four. In this special episode, um, myself and Hibbo, fellow Fantasy Football Hub writers, are also joined by none other than leading injury analyst Ben Dinnery. Welcome, Ben. Nice to have you on the stream with us. Yeah, great to be here, guys. Appreciate the invite and looking forward to it. Hibbo, how are you doing? Nice to see you. I want to bring you in as well. You enjoying this international break? I, I know I told you Ireland were going to win that game and you, you told me it wasn't possible and obviously it will be topical later tonight about Ronaldo, won't it? International breaks are tough for me at the minute, you know, and we were 1-0 up against Portugal and we were beat by Ronaldo and we drew one each with Azerbaijan, so we're now joint bottom of the group with them, so the sooner the FPL comes back, the better, I think. Sounds like it's been a tough time. I guess just before we go straight into the chat with you, Ben, I'd like to just get a couple of bits of housekeeping out of the way. So we hit uh, 1.2K subscribers actually recently, so that's very exciting. I have pledged to dress up as Ali G on air when we hit <laughs> 1,500 subs. So that's an embarrassing moment, but I will do it. We're getting closer. And we will donate again another $100 to the heartfund.eu at 2,000 subs. So as we say, it kind of costs you nothing, makes us put our hands in our pocket for a good cause. So... Help us out. If you're new to the channel, hit like, hit subscribe, and keep in touch with the Net That Whole crew. I'm just going to pass it over to you, Hibbo, about our exciting news because the final week of the Fantasy Football Content Awards. Yeah, so we're, we're proud to announce that we're amongst the finalists in the AFCA Awards under the Best in Fantasy Football video category. So there's going to be a, a link in the YouTube and podcast description so where you can vote for us. And we would appreciate a vote for our partner, Surya, over at All About FPL in the publication category and the FPL wire as well in the podcast category. Now, just to give you a quick rundown of the Money League as well. So the Money League code is FG1XNB. So jump on there. There's some big players on there like FPL Matthews on there, Big Man Bakyar on there, all the team at Net Dad Hall. So shout out at the minute to Mohamed Siddiqui from Singapore. So he leads away in 276 points with an OR of 1,637. So he's flying. Congratulations to him. We have... Uh, the prizes have been finalised, so the first prize is a mystery football shirt box from At Shirt Loot Box. We've got a copy of FPL Obsessed by Matt William, and the third prize is premium annual membership to Fantasy Football Fix. In terms of the podcast, so we've, we've gone past 5,000 downloads now on pod, so we're available basically wherever you listen to your pods. If you do listen on Apple, a five-star review will be very much appreciated because it, it costs you nothing, but it helps us grow. Now, for anybody that uh, watches us back on VOD, so if you don't watch live, if you have any questions about your team going into game week four, drop them in the comments and somebody from the team will pick them up going forward. Perfect. So I think this is going to be one of the earliest times we've managed to stay on track and go straight to the interview. Three minutes in, I'm impressed with us. Um, we're finally getting the script out of the way and we're not wasting 10, 15 minutes of the podcast listeners' time. So we hope they leave a five-star review just for that. So just to kind of give you a bit more of a run through and talk about your credentials, Ben, I'm just going to take this off the slides and make it, as I was saying, a bit more of a fireside kind of chat. So you're obviously an expert in your field. I know for me personally, I'll tell you my story. So I actually found out through the FPL world, mainly through you and Ben Krellin. So you were kind of my go-to for like whether players were going to be an option to start, if I had to sell them, should I buy them? And he was my double game week chip strategy guy. And it was the two Bens. I remember I was on Reddit, more of a lurker for years. And I only came to Twitter like more recently in the last year or two, but it was mainly to follow you two and your content. So I always say that you two are obviously the like bastions of the whole FPL <laughs> community. And it's amazing to have you here with us. Um, I didn't expect this a year ago when we met through the hub. So fantastic to have you. No, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Great, like you say, great to be here. Yeah. Look, look forward to it. I think we're going to have fun. So this is a pleasure. And I will ask you a little bit later about Newcastle because it has a close place to my heart. I actually studied <laughs> up in Durham. So I had to be a Sunderland or Newcastle fan at the time. And I chose wisely, you could say. <laughs> good man. That's good. Nice to hear. <laughs> well, I'm presuming you're talking about the black and white and not the red. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. You know? I'd love to, if I'm up there, we will definitely try and grab a match together. I think uh, our other friend, Ben, he's also there and he's offered a match together if I visit. So I'd like to take you both together and maybe that'd be a nice day out. Yeah, cool. Cool. Look forward nice to it. <laughs> so just to give the viewers, anyone who's new to Ben, and obviously I've said that he needs no introduction, but for anyone who might not know the legend that is Ben Dinnery, so obviously you're the founder of Premier Injuries. It's a site that tracks injury data for the whole Premier League. 
you are also very impressively, I must say, a contributor for kind of the athletic, Sky Sports. I know you've done bits maybe for Talk Sport. You're an ambassador for Fan Team, a daily fantasy site that we play as well, Hibbo and I. So it's safe to say you kind of spin a lot of plates. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about kind of that and how you got into this? Well, I suppose the easiest place would be start at the very, very beginning. Um, so the roots are back in a website called physioroom.com. Um, I'm not sure if that's ever came up on your radar, but that was a website that was formed back in 2001. And as with most ideas um, and businesses, it came about on a, on a Friday evening, a few lads having a couple of beers. And it was just as the, you know, fantasy sports started to get a little bit of traction in this country, a little bit of momentum, registering on people's radars. And um, uh, we had a friend who was studying physiotherapy across at Manchester United. And we were talking about players and availability. And uh, I don't recall the, the, the name of the exact player, the injury, but, you know, we mentioned might have been somebody like Kieran Dyer at Newcastle, one off the top of your head. And sort of the friend, oh, well, I know the physio at Newcastle and I've got his number. I'll drop my text <laughs> and, you know, we'll find out what the crack is. Um, and it, it was, it, it, so it, the idea sort of snowballed from there. Uh, it went from, again, like discussions just between ourselves to then producing uh, weekly previews on talk sport to then creating this very crude, almost Excel spreadsheet of, of player availability um, and this website. And yeah, it just sort of grew exponentially. Um, uh, I moved away from Physio Room uh, for a few years and then I went back in around about 2000 and eight ish and uh, my primary role within the company and, and and by that stage it had grown to a big, uh, big e-commerce website um you selling rehab products and you know sports equipment um supports braces so on and so forth but my role primarily was to collect and collect injury data for the for the table and look after the social media channels um and that was something that i i really that was my passion was the numbers, the data, the statistics. I wasn't really interested in selling the product side of things. Um, and done that for a number of years, that went on to maybe uh, 2012, 13. And, and the business model of Physio Room sort of began to change ever so slightly. Um, the, the fantasy aspect of it and the injury part of the, of the role be, sort of become less and less when there was more emphasis on the sales and the um, and the product side of it. And it was at that stage that I said, well, actually, I think I could maybe make a go of doing some with myself. And and that's how Premier Injuries came about. That's how the idea was, was born. Um, and essentially, we're all just about the numbers and the statistics. And the fantasy element is just one small part in, in what we actually do in the grand scheme of things. You know, we work with insurance companies, sports litigation firms, um, gambling websites, uh, fantasy websites. Um, you know, I've just had a uh, an order in from somebody who was selling jacuzzis and <laughs> just, you know, random. Um, so the, the role, the day-to-day -day role can be so varied and, and challenging. And, and that's really where my passion still lies in, in the actual numbers and the data. And, um, and yeah, and, and fantasy is just, you know, one small cog in the, in the wheel, as it were. I think that that's really fascinating, especially that you touched on that fantasy is just one of many elements of the whole kind of project and what you guys do at Premier Injuries. Yeah, I mean, we always had the difficulty, even with Physio Room back in, in the day, was how do you monetize fantasy football? That that was always the, the you know the burning question. We were generating numbers in excess of a million people a month. Um, and and we had no way of, of capturing that, of, of turning that into to revenue. And even to this day, I think it's a challenge. I mean, there weren't any hubs and, um, you know, there weren't any subscription models. We didn't go down the advertising route. Um, we weren't going for paid sponsorships. So we wanted to try and protect the brand, but also, you know, justify um, the outlay and the amount of work and investment and resource that went into maintaining the website and, and the people that were actually 
uh, ensuring the integrity of the data. And that's, I think that's something that we still sort of battle with. Um, certainly in, in today's environment under the, the circumstances which we're, we're faced with at the moment, you know, with the pandemic and, and COVID. Um, I think, you know, rolling season on season, it's, you know, you may have one good season and then all of a sudden, you know, you can lose one or two contracts, you know, in, in the blink of an eye. At, at, at the closure of the pandemic in March, I think um, I was in the middle of, of creating content for, for three or four sites. I think the announcement was around 10 to 11 on the Friday. By 11 o'clock, I had phone calls off everybody saying, stop work, that's it. You know, there's nothing here for you. And overnight, so uh... yeah, just lost everything. And that was a that was a little bit of an eye-opener into, well, actually, we need to protect ourselves going forward. Uh, you know, we need to ensure that if there was another shutdown, lockdown, closure of the Premier League, do we have other revenue streams in place that are able to sort of sustain us, sustain the business, sustain our families? Um, so that's what we're working towards now. Um, the, 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 the website itself hasn't really changed a lot since we launched, um, but hopefully within the next maybe seven to 14 days, we should have a new website. Um, and there'll be three different facets to that. There will be an e-commerce aspect to it where we are, we'll be selling products um there will be uh obviously the injury related stuff but we'll be going down more um more well uh, utilizing other aspects of social media youtube get experts in um and then we're going to have some some statistical analysis in in terms of so we know obviously that the likes of of the hub and say scout for example uh, very heavy uh, data orientated with opta yeah, well, it's all plugged into Opter. I was thinking if you guys could maybe be the Opter of your space. Well, and that that has actually been mentioned by by clubs before, and uh, and I suppose that's an avenue that we're looking to to go down. We're going to be using data from Statsbomb, but the way we're using data is is the way that clubs actually use the data and how clubs interpret the data. So we're working with a guy who who works within the Premier League, who's a consultant. And we will show, present, interpret, display the data, how the clubs utilise that to give different insights, to give context and to help people understand it in different ways. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I, they always like to, to roll out and, and help maybe simplify what I mean by that is uh, when we come to the injury table, it's all about return to play. So, you know, we have, let's have a look who we got on there at the moment. Kevin De Bruyne. Uh, you know, premium player carrying an the ligament injury since the Euros. We have a projected return to play in potentially game week four. Yeah, all well and good, but ultimately, what the fantasy community really, really wants to know it's not a return to play, it's a return to performance. Because you don't want to spend all of that money on Kevin De Bruyne for him to, you know, sit back and, and not really do much for two or three game weeks while he's playing his way back in, while he's building that load, while he's getting that sharpness. So we'll be working on it's that return to performance element to help FPL managers make informed decisions on when they should bring certain players into their teams when they're recovering or returning from injury. I have a bit of a question for you, Ben. So, like, how do you go about gathering this kind of injury and lineup information? Because, like, I assume you've got like a huge range of contacts, and like, how, how do you collate it and pull it up, pull it all together? Yeah, um, it's, it's very, very labour intensive. First and foremost, it's it's seven days a week, three hundred and sixty five days a year. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of people may just think, well, y your season is thirty eight game weeks long, but. We have out of season, you've got training, you've got pre-season, you've got friendlies, you've got behind closed doors, you've got bounce games, you've got uh, international tournaments. Uh, so we're tracked all through that. Um, in your right, we've got a, an extensive sort of contact list. Now, depending upon on the clubs, uh, the players, um, it will depend on whether we're working with medical departments, with PA departments, or um, you know, prominent figures related or associated with the club um, to to help just sort of what we're trying to create is a robust database of of, of players and in injuries 
And I think for us, the, the guessing gamer is really is, is that return to play, is that potential return, because clubs and medical departments will rarely hang their hat on a, a return date. Because as we've seen maybe with Arsene Wenger during his time when he was at, at Arsenal, um, medical department faced a lot of flack for comments that Arsene Wenger would say about players are, you know, Van Persie's due back this weekend, you know, and he's still three weeks away. For the average Joe in the street, you know, they're like, well, well, the medical team's crap. That physio's crap. How, you know, why, where's it taking, why is it taking an extra two to three weeks? Medical department's gone, he's nowhere near. Uh, you know, why is Arsene Wenger saying that? Uh, and ultimately as well, what, what people don't or fail to understand um, the involvement of the of the medical department is reactionary. You know, they, players are presented when there's a problem and those players are passed on once they've done that that sort of small section of their recovery process at that stage of the rehab. They have no control over load management, no control over um, the types of strength and condition that they do. They don't have any control whether... Um, a medical department tells the manager, well, actually, this player isn't fit, isn't ready, and goes against their wishes and starts them anyway. Which And there's many, many examples of, of, of that actually happening. But it always falls at the, you know, the toes of the department when something goes wrong, which is a little bit harsh and a little bit um, you know unjust. So we try to educate as well as much as we possibly can and as much as people want to hear, which is, which is sometimes difficult. On social media, it, in it is interesting when you say that sometimes factors outside the medical room's control, so managers playing players they've been advised not to, kind of maybe makes the situation worse, and then ultimately it's the medical department that get the kind of burden of that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it, it's a it's a, it's a collective approach to, um, you know, in in what I suppose it's it's injuries are rarely black and white, and it's a it's rarely a straight smooth line to injury to recovery there's lots of twists and turns and bumps in the road um and things to consider you're talking about a player's status within a team if they're a high profile player squad depth strength importance of game stakeholders we've never even mentioned those so owners chairman you know why is my best player not on the pitch i've seen him training today he looks fine to me get him in the team you know um managers who are under pressure you know to get results so risks are taken. Players that they know are maybe in the red zone, as we often hear, uh, risk in the hope that, well, actually, if he does score, if he does play well, then the chances are we're going to win. So it's 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 a difficult game that, that we play in terms of projecting that return to play. Uh, and it's one that I've learned over the years that you have to be very careful with, with the, the level of information that you do give um, because there are... Lots of people out there who are dying to fight to get things wrong. There's a lot of speculation as well, isn't there? Every uh, word, they hang by every word you say. So you've got to be careful <laughs> anything you say. Like, obviously, you might recall last year when I had a little bit of source, nothing compared to your sources, but I gave a few lineups. And if you, like, even get it right, people are abusing you. So your account, you have like 150k followers, is that right? You're verified uh, on Twitter. You must have yeah. so many messages. Yeah, you uh, look. I mean, <laughs> look. Put it this way: if I if I do something wrong, I know about it. <laughs> um, and and I did for for years and years when I was building up that following um, to to get the account where it is. I always said, right. Well, if anybody asks me a question, no matter how many times I've been asked. I will respond, I'll read it and I'll respond. As the account sort of grown, and maybe it's, I still try to do as much as I possibly can. But so I see, I do see everything. Um, and I, I have really, I, I try to adopt a, a zero tolerance when it comes to abuse. And I never engage anymore because mm. there is, you know, there's no point. In, and a lot of the time, people are just, you know, trying maybe to get a few followers uh, on the back of uh, any you know an, an argument so I'm, I'm a little bit too long in the tooth for that and also this look this is my full-time job this is my business this is my livelihood. Your livelihood yeah it's 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 my family it's the mortgage it's the kids so you know whatever persona 
I portray it out there for all and sundry to see. I have to be really careful um, to protect that, that um, you know, this, this, this image, this profile that's been created over, you know, over several years. So it's difficult. So, I, you know, I make the decision just to take myself out of the loop completely and just, I normally just block on mute. I think that's um, a good plan. We've yeah. learned that the hard way. We've entertained a few trolls in our time. And on some of the episodes of Net That Hall, when I have too many different types of drinks, I end up uh, <laughs> calling people out. So there's always like each episode a two minute rant. And I'll send you one or two of them after that. <laughs> you'll have a good laugh, a good crack. Um, yeah. I want to ask you something actually. So, about the kind of estimated timelines you were talking about, obviously, people are always pressing for a date but it's not necessarily about a date of return. It's about a date of return to performance or to that level, right? So, you know, when you see an injury, I always wondered, do you kind of look at it and think it's a grade two tear and you provide a timeline based on that? Or is it actually you're waiting to see the quotes from that club? Like, do you trust the quotes or do you use more your knowledge of the actual specific injury or a combination? I don't know. Like, tell us a bit about that process. How do you Yeah. Like that? <clears throat> I mean, again, it depends on the club, it depends on the player, and it depends on the manager and, and who's actually speaking. What I would always say, I would take anything that's said um, with a pinch of salt in terms of maybe um, specifics around it. Some managers are better than others. Some clubs are better than others. There are lots of examples where, um, you know, I know that, that managers are saying players are injured and they're not. Um you know, because of, uh, for fear that the, of, of a social media backlash, how could you drop our best player um, and we got beat, you know, you we want you out of our club. It's easier just to say, well, he's injured. Um, do, do you remember when uh, Ozil, he never made like an away trip in years up north and he'd always kind of stay at home with a cold or a flu. He must have had like the flu eight times in three seasons. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, Mr. Sick Note. Yeah, I'm very, very, very aware of that one. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I work, I work quite closely with with Arsenal. Probably of all of the of the top flight clubs, nice. Arsenal are probably the club that I work with. Uh, I've worked with the longest and and have the most open lines of communication. I think they're a club of values. Whatever their performance on the pitch may be now, Arsene Wenger said, "Protect the values." I'm worried that the current ownership are not, but. There is something, as you say, about the club where they do try and do right. Like today they were celebrating, there was a Jewish holiday I saw. Like they're very inclusive of all their fans across the world. And I think for the banter club we are now, there is some values at the club that hopefully will stay on past finger. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, we've, I've had a bit of a rocky relationship with Arsenal in the past. We, we got off on a on the wrong foot. Um I, I mean, that was probably going back to maybe 2009, 2010 in an article that went out. Um, and I think it was The Telegraph. And and that was about it. There was a lot of talk always that did also have the worst injury record. Um, why are Arsenal players always getting injured? You know, let's scratch beneath the surface and find out whether that's the truth. And, and The Telegraph actually ran a big... Um, Jeremy Wilson, who was chief sports writer at the time, ran a big massive two-page spread broadsheet it, and it was great kudos for me for the company for the brand and uh, the quote was um the the company's leading sports injury analyst and i would say like, wow and uh, so I, get, I got a phone call from arsenal and i was like jesus christ this is things are looking up yeah ben come down um we've got a champions league game it must have been a tuesday or a wednesday night we've got a champions league game. come down uh, meet Wenger, uh, do the press conference, meet the backroom staff, uh, yada, yada, yada. Oh, great. Huh? That sounds fantastic. Um, so I was like, just, well, just come, ah, just, just come down. Look, there's no pressure. There's nothing. And uh, so, yeah, I sort of turned up and um, I was invited to go along to this, this just, oh, just come along. And, and I walked into this boardroom and it was a, must be like a 15 foot table. And there was about 10 people sitting around it and they all had photocopies of this telegraph uh, in front of them with this article with bits highlighted. And they're like, all right, um, this is what you said. This data here. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was totally blindsided. Uh, but ultimately that, uh, the long and short of it was, they come back and said, look, 
if you're going to report uh, injuries for the club, we want it to be a fair reflection of what's actually happening. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, any queries, or you want anything clarified, speak to us and we'll tell you, you know, exactly what the crack is. And and that's sort of how things happen. And, and things have slowly started to, to grow with, with other clubs in that respect. And, um, yeah, it, it's difficult because you're never, ever going to get uh, a 100% feel of what's actually happening at the clubs. It's just, you know, in terms of confidentiality, um, but what we do try and always maintain is in terms of, of the information that we get, ca can it be the best out there and can it be as, as robust as we possibly can? And hopefully with the contacts and the, you know, those the, the open um, lanes of communication, we try to do that. Um, so, on, yeah. On that note, Ben, I just, this feels like a great topical time to get this question from friend of the show uh, blue nicks underscore 99 it seems relevant to what you're saying about different clubs giving different levels of transparency and it is quite interesting that someone like arsenal would say oh no like we can see why you fought all that we're gonna grill you first but come to us in the future and we'll give you the answers it sounds like they ambushed you it's not a nice approach as you say i understand <laughs> the rocky start to the relationship but it's how we led you today right the leadings uh, the country's leading injury analyst so I think it sounds like throughout that 10-year tenor, you've always kind of been there at the forefront of this uh, industry. And just on that note, do you, as a kind of thought leader, I guess I will call you in this space, think that the Premier League should be kind of more transparent with their reporting of injuries or availability in the NFL? Like I've heard from friends that in the NFL, like they kind of get fined, I guess, if they did what you said, which is say someone's injured when actually they're training, for instance. Yeah, I mean... I... <sighs> I, I don't fully understand the the NFL model, but I think it's it's down the route of of, of the gambling laws, so they have their those, that tr level of transparency. For me, I think first and foremost, that may be me out of a job, or certainly I, I become less important on the totem pole if if information is is out there to all and sundry. Um, so guys, so do, don't lobby for it. Lobby <laughs> against it. <laughs> so I do like that 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 shroud of you know that the smoke and mirrors aspect of it. And then secondly, uh, you know, uh, I think there's just that element of, of of fun and second guessing and taking that risk with an FPL and, and maybe making your own informed judgment and decisions. If we all had all of the information to hand. Would we all be going down the same route? Would we all be selecting the same players? And um, look, we will I come to that, Ben, because I know you're famously anti-template. You were telling me before, and maybe when we get to the FPL part, we will ask you a little bit about your management style. And your, I know you've got wildcard active, so I'm sure the listeners will be keen to hear about that too. But I don't want to leave the current day job just yet for the FPL. Um, so j just on that note, just hold that thought. If they were kind of giving us these 25%, 50%, 75% on the FPL website right now, we had a lot of questions in advance of saying, how is that determined? And on your site, I know you put percentages as well. So are you just kind of taking their calculation or is it that you've got your own calculation to them? Um, look, I mean, I, I, if there's one thing that lets down the official game is those return to play status percentages which are absolutely a waste of time. Um, look, I've got a medical background. I've got um, over 10 years worth of, of data, historical data on teams, on managers, on players, on injuries. So when we um, have a player or a setback, we're looking at a number of, of, of performance indicators in terms of when can that player return so we're looking at you know where they are at stages of the rehab. Um, we're looking at uh, ordinarily how long that player would take to recover. Are they quick healers? Are they inherently slow? Are they risk averse? Um, you know what type of manager? Look, what is their status within a team? So you know you, that that kind of be underestimated, I suppose. Kevin De Bruyne again, great example of that. Should he have been playing? I think it was back in maybe game week two. When he came back, absolutely not. Why was he? Well, because he's a high-profile, high-status player. Man City lost their opening fixture, and you know Pep wanted to throw him in there as a, you know. So it's and and we base our return to play percent, and it's 
look, again, it's not an exact science and there is a lot of subjectivity around it. It's a little bit of a gray area, but we're making informed, um, you know, status updates. Whereas FPL, I've seen it where players have went off and ruptured an ACL and they're like 50% to play next game. <laughs> and you're thinking you know, this is no chance like they're out uh, for yeah. a whole season yeah exactly so uh, i mean and, and that's that, again that's no disrespect but that's somebody that's probably just processing that initial you know feedback from a post-match press conference such as the such intern as, uh, right the office yeah, intern <laughs> yeah uh, you know player a has got a knee injury um we don't know how serious it is we'll have that assessed and you go, right, great, we'll, we'll put that quote in and we'll go 50% for next game week. You know, but the reality is, is there's absolutely no chance. So when we're talking about updating those those player statuses, everything that's done on that table is done with thought and with meaning and with intent. There's nothing just done, you know, for the sake of doing that. And, and, and almost, you know, at the time of writing, I hasten to add, because, you know, statuses can change day to day and even hour by hour in some cases, um, especially with COVID and, uh, you know, the testing and quarantine and that we have these days. So, um, look, it's it's something which, let's like say, it's seven days a week. I mean, the, the injury team 365 itself, days a year for any of the new viewers who are live since you told us originally. Um, it's a yeah. non-stop job, right? Like uh, Christmas Day. I mean, one of, one of the things of the last few years has always been, I always do updates on the New Year's Eve at midnight. That that's just nice. me, you know, just so I'm sitting at a computer actually updating. And people are going, Ben, shut up, stop providing the updates. Um, you know, <laughs> go and enjoy yourself, have a drink, relax. Um, but like I said, this is this is my job. It's it's not a hobby. Mm. And 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 while the social media aspect of, of it means that it's just people may not understand that there's a wider circle outside of fantasy, you know, that the, it's a the, small part of what you were doing, we were saying earlier, right? Yeah. It's a um, very small so fraction. The integrity of the data is massive when we're working with insurance companies and, and, and sports litigation firms, we need to ensure that, you know, it is robust and it stands up um, to examination. So just one it, quick comment I want to make before Hibo asks you some stuff. So I realized that when we talk about the, level playing field and the smoke and mirrors of not knowing when someone's available so i love that too and i think obviously we when we met a couple of seasons back towards the end of last season when there was the i think it was one hour deadlines i felt at that point it was a bit unfair right because now i'm not someone who has your contact book or your sources and i somehow even knew like lineups because the media knew it and i knew people who knew as well and i thought if someone like me knows these lineups how many years of like top fpl managers with ties to the premier league have also had the lineups and i used to watch deadline streams where they do a move and then suddenly all the experts would have taken a minus eight and sold the legit captain options to that week and you wouldn't know why unless they had early news and i think to myself now that i've seen the early team news how many people knew this so i kind of put it out there publicly just because i felt if i knew then more people should know because it wasn't a level playing field and don't you think it's incredible that after five years of not changing a single rule in the official fpl they then move the deadline off to people like rockstar who obviously who knows who he is but i know what i did is scarface and like i'm now gone so i can admit it because it was years ago and there's no paper trails but you know if i knew how many people knew firstly and secondly do you agree that it is better now i guess with the 90 minute deadline because we can finally start to speculate again and that smoke and mirrors element is there and we don't all have the same team and when we go to fpl later obviously it will reference your six premiums you told me but yeah, I mean, look, I, I, for me, I, I, it's it adds to the excitement of the game, and you know, to remove that, um, you know, then then ultimately, why are you playing? Why why are you playing FPL? Look, for ninety nine point nine 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 percent of of the people I play, you aren't going to win top prize. So surely it's just about bragging rights, having a laugh, getting one over on your mates, but and doing it in the right way. You know, um, I never, I never asked for um, predicted lineups ahead of, ahead of deadline. I don't even, um, you know, necessarily ask for particular player updates from clubs. Um, you know, is he, is he in the team? Is he going to be back? Is he going to start? 
Um, I'm just I'm just not that interested in doing so. And and it, it was it's something that just wouldn't sit very easy. And ultimately, you know, um, a lot of clubs and might even tell me anyway. Um, so I think it's crazy though because there was a problem for years. Because do you remember there was that Liverpool account that would give the full Liverpool eleven like days in advance? <laughs> and so yeah. I think this has been going on for a long time. I feel like the Premier League have been having this issue for a long time, and I wonder why they don't improve their security or their processes. It's, <laughs> it's all a little bit strange to me for a kind of company of that size with so much money in the sport, right? I just I find the whole thing ludicrous to be honest. Well, the, the Liverpool leaks were actually coming from players within the squad, mm. right? Um, so they were getting uh, released via a brother who would then feed that to somebody else. And, you know, how it And goes. it can affect your team's performance when it's days in advance, right? Because the opponent manager could, if it's legit and it's been legit for months, could they could prepare for the game yeah. properly. Yeah. They yeah. Can I mean, like... I mean, even when you, even within in, in the, fan, the realms of fantasy anyway, there's a lot of players, there's a lot of uh, backroom stuff. Jack Greenish last year. Do you remember when uh, Dean Smith wasn't impressed that he made a transfer in his fantasy team and a, a robot picked it up and tweeted out that he'd sold a player who was injured? Yeah, I mean, it, so this uh, look, there's this, I dare say, that there's loads of that that go on. Um, so you can't enforce all of it, I guess, but it adds to the smokes and mirrors, which is what we all kind of are here for. And I guess it's it's good fun. So, on that note, do you have any kind of club spies ever ask you so i know you don't ask clubs if their players are starting but do you ever have like burner accounts that look like they've been created and they're like oh do you know if uh like saka starts today or bomb yang starts <laughs> uh, no no yeah not, no not spies from tottenham no no okay yeah <laughs> just, hey, just, I'll, let you, I'll let you in i uh, just just a touch back on your company obviously premier injuries who exactly are you supplying information to? Look, so say we're talking on the broadcast and prompt media, you, you you mentioned gambling companies and like a daily fantasy sport. So who, who exactly does this involve? I mean, if you're talking about um, uh, mainstream media companies, we've had data to Sky Sports, BT Sport, NBC Sports, uh, you name it, uh, Eurosport, CNN. Uh, when we're talking about broadsheet newspapers, Times, Telegraph, uh the mirror, uh, anybody that wants it really. Typically, if there's a, a high profile injury or there is a in and around international breaks, if there's a lull in, you know, in any newsworthy, you know, breaking uh, threads or news that, that going out, they'll, they'll come to me and, and somebody may just have an idea about uh, quite often. It always used to, if, if Pep came out with something, I think a couple of seasons ago around Christmas, he said this, this, festive fixture period is, is killing my players so straight away you have like three or four journalists on the full right well are they, are you, is this killing all players how many injuries do we see are there more injuries what types of injuries how long are these players out um uh you know we talk about maybe it's Jürgen Klopp might mention something about players who are involved in, in internationals uh the AFCON and then coming back and then having you know this short arrest period um and in the travel you know so it's just it can be it can go from being you know the quietest you could have 23 hours of a day where there's literally nothing going on and then all of a sudden bang and it's you know you you would have a talk sport or bbc5 live um, it's like you know, 9 54 p.m this sunday night <laughs> i mean that uh, yeah i think when was one of the latest was um I think it was a Luke Shaw when it was it the double leg fracture. Uh, that was a Champions League night, and it was, you know, it, it was almost like wait, I'm just ready to turn me. Oh, oh, Jesus! Then the phone goes, can you come on after the match? And then can you come on right? And then we've got, um, and then we want you to come on uh, first thing tomorrow. And so you're doing one at midnight, and then somebody wants you on at like six o'clock the next morning, and it's, oh, um, yeah, and, and incredible. It's so literally within you know within the space of seconds, uh, everything can change. So, um, and that's why we have to sort of ensure that we're that we're always you know following stuff and monitoring and, and making sure that we're you know up with everything that's that's actually happening. Because like you say, we don't know um, when we may get a request to supply data or comment or um, you know whatever that may be. 
So you, guess, you've, um, you've obviously been creating this content for like 10 plus years and in that time, like what's been your biggest kind of scoop in terms of like injury news that you broke like exclusively? The, the best one, and, and this will stand out, because in the modern era, when it comes to social media, somebody somewhere always knows. And whether uh, it's, it's, it's out there and it's mainstreamed or it just goes underneath the radar, somebody somewhere always knows. And <clears throat> I've got a, there was one Friday afternoon, it was when Eden Hazard was at Chelsea uh, and, I, and I got contacted and I said, look, <clears throat> guy said, look, uh, Chelsea were playing away at, at Leicester uh, on the Saturday and uh, get in touch and said, look, uh, I don't know if, if Eden Hazard is playing tomorrow, but the first team left on a train this afternoon and Eden Hazard's at Cobham with his son watching him play. So I was right. like, all right, okay. And I was thinking, oh, surely not. Surely this is somebody somewhere's picked up on this. I mean, Eden Hazard, he's, you know, he's one of the biggest players in the, in the Premier League at the time. Um, so uh, I found out that he had a, a calf injury. So put, put it out there, Eden Hazard hasn't travelled, calf problem out of the Leicester game. <sighs> Got contacted by one journalist, two journalists. I had them from uh, from Belgium. Um, me DM, so just and <laughs> one hour, two hours. Nobody anywhere, anywhere in the world had any inclination that this was the case. Are you sure that's right? Are you sure he's injured? Uh, we haven't heard anything. You know, when you, you, I was like... Doubt myself. I'm second. I'm just thinking this. This is wrong. You can't even put out a second tweet. Um, because just, you're worried if you say more, they'll hold on to that as well. I, I was just, and I was just like, oh, and I was thinking, please, somebody somewhere in the world, just, just confirm it. <laughs> went at nine o'clock, ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, twelve. Nobody went to bed. Honestly, I couldn't sleep. Every by this part, everybody, my timeline was just going ballistic. Um, journalists, what can we quote? You can we put it in? And it was about, I think it was about nine o'clock the Saturday morning. It actually got confirmed by um, Christophe Terrell, who was a really well-respected, well-renowned Belgian journalist uh, who basically gets everything when it comes to to those in and around the national team and those, um, uh, you know, players of of of, uh, of the ilk of, of the Hazards and the Lukaku's. And, and he confirmed it. And it was like, just like a massive, huge, huge sigh of relief. But to go... Let's say 12 plus hours in the modern era um, with, with social media the way it is to be able to break that and, uh, and yeah, have that sort of, that moment where nobody else had it. Although I, I wasn't able to appreciate and enjoy it as much as I would have liked because at the end it was just, I was just praying, just, just please, just please be right because, uh, <laughs> like you say, it's just not worth the... Um, and and it, it, even though you've got sources within the club, and you, 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 you see, there's always that niggling bit of doubt in the in the back of your mind. Uh, I that. know what you mean. Those fifteen minutes when I used to put like certain players are starting, till the official lineup came out, because I was at the mercy of my own source. I was always like, what if he's lied to me? What if he's fed me the wrong lineup? And I've gone public, and as you say, like maybe there's millions of impressions on your tweet, and you start to worry. Like, I mean, it, and, and that was only 15 minutes. God knows how you felt for over 12 hours. And it was, I mean, that was a bad one. But, but on 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 the opposite side, you know, on the flip side of that, um, and and it goes to show that, like, see, everything's not black and white. I remember um, there was an injury. He was a big big fantasy player at the time, it was Glenn Johnson when he was at Liverpool. Don't recall the precise nature of the injury, but Liverpool were playing on the Saturday evening. Uh, so 5.30 kickoff. Lots and lots of questions. High ownership player. Um, is, is Glenn Johnson fit? 100%. I guarantee you he is fit. He's definitely playing. Laid it out there. Had it, you know, again, the information was solid. Nobody had that. It was speculation, but nobody was able to, to categorically state that Glenn Johnson was fit and ready. But I knew, sure enough, the Liverpool team news was announced at 4.30 on the, on the Saturday night and there was no Glenn Johnson in the team. Um, and I caught... <laughs> oh, my God. You had to mute your whole account. Just, just, just like... like 
your heart sank and I just was like, so one, you, you cannot come out and say anything. <laughs> you cannot burn that, that, that sauce. And it wasn't until like the Monday or the Tuesday. Um, it's not like you, you fire in again. What the hell's been going on? That was tough. And he went, look, I, I apologize. He says, uh, Glenn Johnson had trained. He went down for breakfast on the Saturday morning. He was eating breakfast. Didn't feel very well. Went down with illness. Sent back to bed by mid midday. Tucked up in bed with illness. And it was just like... You can never though, know what will happen, as you say. It's 99.99%. And of course, as far as everybody in social media is, was concerned, you're a fraud. You're clueless. You know, you're just guessing. And sometimes you just have to stand up and take it on the chin and go, and wait, well... You know, you will believe what you want to believe in, and and that's it, really. <laughs> that is incredible. Um, I think what we wanted to do as well is before we go to the FPL specific, I was I was telling you earlier, I was going to show that the top transfers as well. So in the context of this game week, looking at who the top eight most transferred in and out players are, and then I know we've talked a little bit about the kind of your history over this time. We're going to talk a bit about those players that are coming in. And I think there's a lot of questions from Twitter that are quite similar, to be honest, as you can imagine, about the same old players like the Calvert-Lewins, the Lukaku's, um, the Argentinian contingent that were they were trying to put them on the pitch, as you say, so bringing mm -hmm. those quarantine rules to a new level. Um, there's been a lot of craziness happening. But just before we show those transfers and we talk about the FPL players, we actually wanted to ask you a little bit about your kind of um, fan team. I know you're an ambassador. And I guess it would be good to know what role you play because I've actually seen you on a, I think it was a Who Scored stream with uh, Az and Lynn. And I thought that was quite interesting. And we know you've done official fan team stuff with Fergie, who obviously heads up content at Hub, where all three of us have met and write together. So tell us a little bit about kind of fan team. It would be interesting to know how you got involved in that. Yeah, so um, I've been with fan team now. It, it was conversations that we've had uh, over a long time, probably maybe go even going back a couple of years um, so you may or may not be familiar with a with a guy called Leon Cantwell. Uh, fantasy I know the name. I know the name. Yeah. So fantasy football pundits was was Leon's website, um, and and almost we were. I don't know. It's, you know, some of the big original founders of, of of fantasy football content. I mean, like I say, going back to two thousand and ten ish, there was fantasy Yamar, fantasy pundits. And Leon was was the the first sort of content provider to really make it big, a hundred k plus followers on social media, um, millions of of um, uh, visitors to his website every month. I mean, massive. And um, so me and Leon always sort of maintained that relationship through fantasy and, and helped him out and I've done some work for him uh, in other aspects. And, and he joined fan team uh, a few years back and, and we always kept in touch. And, and if there was anything that sort of cropped up, he would ask me if I would like to get involved. And, and like I say, we had a bit of back and forth with regards to potentially uh, what role I could be involved in and, and what that would look like. Uh, because I haven't really done a lot of work uh, around, you know, I, I never ever wanted to sell me soul, although I've always, in terms of both the website and the social media content, um, you know, there are opportunities to, to go out and make money there if you want it. But for me, it was always about do, wanting to do that in the right way. And again, protecting the brand, protecting me and, and doing things necessarily the right way and, and, and doing things that I sort of believed in. Uh, and I really liked the fan team concept. It's not just something which I, I say because I'm an ambassador. I actually enjoy playing fan team. So there was a there was an easy uh, sort of meeting of the two. And it, it, I always sort of maintain that I, I would never hard sell. Um, you know, it's always about, well, I'm playing this and I really am playing this. This is my team. This is what I do. Watch the video. Listen to what I've got to say. If you want to get involved, you can do. If not, look, that's absolutely fine. We totally understand there's, there's people with you know different objectives within their um, you know within their fantasy gameplay. Um, and this is just something that I that I want to play with them. Um so I've probably you take it more seriously, don't you? Just to quickly butt in there like you probably would you say you enjoy kind of fan team probably more because there is life-changing sums of money 
on the uh, line as opposed to say FPL? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm under absolutely no illusion that um, one, I, I'm never ever ever gonna win FPL, and and I'm never ever gonna win the big one on uh, on fan team, but there are opportunities there to to cash out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot. the The game pool is a lot smaller than it is on FPL, so the percentages of of, of places paid is is a lot higher. Um, and I would say a crossover like the I'm a player. Um, I get bored easily. I don't like to stick with the norm. I like to do things differently. And and the monster in particular suits my style of of, of fantasy gameplay. Um, you know, it, it, like I say, there's a, it meshes quite well because it's it allows me to to pick players and do things which you would never entertain or do in a season long game whether it be fan team or uh fpl um it allows you to just and it, and, it, and that's what i really like uh you know what you tend to see with my team is i will either absolutely bomb and come nowhere or i will do quite well and finish in the money so I'll never big punts, right? Like, do you, do you do stacking as well? So, when Hibo and I learned about fan team, we would kind of pick defenders from the same team, even though there was a penalty. But it was, I guess, easier to predict one clean sheet, not two, for instance. Yeah, look, I, I'll just go with with what my gut is and what I fancy. Um, and like I say, I mean, as an example, in the last uh, was a game week three when Arsenal played Man City. If I've got that right, I mean, I stacked, I stacked Arsenal defenders. Um, yeah, that's what we say. It can either just go completely implode, or you yeah. win big money. Like I think our friend on the hub group at night, uh, Ryan, is it FF Ninja? Yeah, he man. won one of the monsters, and I think he won like the nine k cash prize. And he won yeah, the like, season, season defense, was it? Yeah, it was a, it was a season finale. He won, I think, ten grand the final game mm. week last year. Yeah, yeah, over like, yeah double fit. Sheffield. Yeah, double Sheffield defense. But as you say, it popped. Yeah, and, and so look, I, I go in with my eyes open and understand that you know what it is maybe eight or nine times out of ten, uh, it isn't going to amount to much, but there's an opportunity there that that sometimes when you're in the you know, profit, it's ROI, right? When the profits are over a certain percentage, it's it, it's still gambling and it's still eighteen plus. We'll put that out there, but for me, I'd prefer it over an accumulator all day, as you say. So it's interesting that you only wanted to be an ambassador of something that you saw the vision in the product and you believed in and obviously you had the history with the people who were there. So that, that's really interesting how you got involved. Yeah, and look, I, I actually really do believe in the product as well. I just think, I think it's a game changer and I'm quite surprised that maybe the, the community hasn't taken to it as, as much as I, I feel it, it should. It's still... It's still massively underutilized in terms of of the number of players in their season long game there's a million a million pound up there for grabs within that prize pool i think they were paying up the first eight or nine thousand places i mean you don't have to be that good to get well, your i've got 12 <laughs> teams right now and uh fortunately all 12 of them are in the money so yeah i had a couple of them are in the top 1k and obviously like, there's a big difference between top 100 and top 1k but if I can just get one or two teams into the top hundred, I'll be very happy. I mean, yeah, and and, and um, I mean, we we spoke to Josh, uh, Josh Wood Woodbridge, I think uh, he he won last yeah. year's fan team. I mean, two hundred k. It is just you know, it's it's just obscene amounts of money. Um, and and yes, look, there are uh, they do a lot of research, and there's a the due deal, but almost there's a there's that element of luck in there as well and uh and that's it's you know if you're prepared to to do that little bit of hard work and you get that little bit of luck then you know that there's a possibility that you could win some life-changing amounts of money yeah like we're, we have both I, I like what you say about playing the monster because it's a bit like playing your free hat every week you know you're kind of starting with a clean slate and we played some of the qualifiers last week for the ucl satellites and like Mima, you won four seats, and I think I won three seats. So I was very happy. We're, we're both going to play the Champions League format. I think it's it's. I think it's a two hundred and fifty k pot for that. It's my first Champions yeah. League format, um, and I don't think I will do the official game. I think I've been too many games this year. I'm trying stuff like Sky um, as well. So 
anything with money, I'm going to try and get better at those formats. I think obviously we know Fergie won the Dream Team last year. Yeah. Well, so we're surrounded by illustrious winners. It is. I feel like I need to use this knowledge and I guess your expertise and we all need to try and apply this knowledge to a couple of life-changing sums and we will win the first place, Ben, one of the three of us here. Mark, my <laughs> words, no, no, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I, and as well, I, I, I like um, the, the Champions League in particular. They had a... In terms of the rules, it was very. I don't know if you played the Euros as well. How they, um, how yeah, they that was, lock. It was a really nice system, I think. And you, where well, you couldn't change, you couldn't have any transfers from the semis to the final, which you know gives you an opportunity for those players who are you know in second, third, or fourth and pushing for top within many leagues or what have you, or pushing for places. It gives you an opportunity to to still claw something back because you may have you know occasions where players above you you know if there's a shock they've only got three or four players you know involved in a final so i like that aspect of it as well so just going back to fpl then actually before we move on to the player specifics for the game week um we mentioned earlier that you were on a wild card and i know you said six premiums and i was kind of saying surely it's not possible and it must be a maximum of five i think you've had a look since and it'll be interesting to hear kind of how you filled this team because We've been debating is kind of two or three premiums the right number this game week um, on the timeline, but I'm hearing five. I assume one of them is Trent, so maybe just four. And I assume one of them might be Sun. But either way, it's impressive. So those are my guesses. Am I close or am I way off the mark? Well, you, you, you are with Trent. So Trent is is, is obviously in there. Um, so I, I, I wild carded in game week three. Um, and I was adamant throughout the build-up to, to week three that I wouldn't be pulling the trigger because we had the international break and knew there's a possibility that you could be losing players, uh, injury, quarantine, uh, you know, COVID, whatever. So, but then um, I started messing on. Uh, I might have been a little bit bored. And I just thought, you know, is it possible to get five premiums in and then see if I could fill those remaining slots up with with players who are still getting minutes and, and possibility of, of not just being fodder, but actual players who are, you know, in, in half decent nick. And um, so I went with me five and then I built the team around the five and, eh, you know, it's all right. Look, I play FPL as a, as a, as a I play differently. Um, last season, um, you know, I was set and forget for people that follow my social media, set and forget captain. Um, and I, I'm very much anti-template in terms of, I think last year, if a player would had over ten percent ownership, I, I couldn't pick him. So I was just, you know, I, I had to, and that was just sort of rules that I um, just put on myself, just to keep us on my toes and to keep interest, to keep things exciting. Because there's, I started this season and I thought, actually, I'm going to give it a proper go. Um, I'm going to try. I'm, I'm creating a little bit more fantasy content this year than I ever have done. I've sort of broadened the horizons in terms of, yes, I've always been about the injuries and, and team news and maybe the impact of potential returners. Now um, I've sort of spread my wings and I'm doing a bit of content on captaincy picks and, and so on and so forth. So I thought, well, actually, I best try a little bit harder and um, – and I started off in game week one, and I, and I thought I had a pretty solid game week. I think I, I returned 80, 82 points, which which was all right. Um, I had Bruno, uh, I had Salah, obviously they banged him, and that was great. And I looked at my overall rank after getting 82 points, and I think I was at 2 million, two, maybe 2.1 <laughs> million. And I just, you know what, I just thought, what is the point in that? I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that and that for me that was the worst game week I've ever had in my life, and I just thought I'm going back. That's it. I'm, I'm bored. If if fantasy football just for me was like right. that, I don't want to play it. I'm not interested. So I just went. I'm going anti template again. I think me me template was up to about forty eight percent, and I, I was looking to do just something different than a set and forgetting. And it was the five premiums which people had been you know, talking about or could it be done. Uh, so I did, and I think I've took me template back down to about 11%-ish, I think, the last I looked. Just for anyone who doesn't know, by the way, so 
if you've not used livefpl.net, it does give you when the game with loads what your percentage template is. And I must say, like, does like, what what are the words it shows you on the screen? Because I'm sure um, Ragabolly would have kind of programmed it, but I've only ever seen like even moderately differential or very differentials about fifty percent. So I don't know um, what eleven percent shows, but oh well, I've, it's it's shown twelve now, and it just okay. got very differential. Very okay. Yeah, so I think from about your yeah, from like under fifty percent. There is no other one because they, they don't know that there's players like you out there, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was so, yeah. It was something else like amazingly differential. Or... Yeah, no. Um, and, and I think the lowest, I think the lowest I've ever been was maybe a five or six percent. Right. And wow. So I, I would literally, it, it got to the point where, um, so now, for example, I will not touch Ronaldo. Um, it, there's just no appeal there for me whatsoever because his ownership levels are through the roof. In fact, I'm more inclined to stick with Bruno. I've seen he's the highest player transferred out heading out of this game week. And everything points to the fact that he's going to have a massive downturn in his points, in his output. He's going to be offset pieces, or, or certainly so. He's going to be, we think, he's going to be off penalties. Um, Cristiano is going to grab the, the headlines. He's probably going to pick up all those um, bonus points. And so, look, if everybody just, if it's a fire sale and everybody's off Bruno, then great, because that makes my team even more of a differential. Um, but I think you're you, right. This is incredible. And I just want to say for the podcast listeners who can't see what I've put up on the screen while you said that, just to illustrate your point. So Ronaldo has had about a million transfers in this game week, and Bruno is currently on about 640,000 out. So they are still kind of um, 50% or just under 50% ownership for Fernandez. But I do think once you look at captaincy in the top 300,000, for instance, um, especially over the next two to three weeks, it will very much swing in the other direction. And Bruno will likely be the differential. So it's interesting that that is an appeal to you. And I don't know how you got an under 10% uh, EO, but we'll read out uh, just quickly before we carry on, Ben, the rest of the transfers as well for the podcast listeners. Um, so second most transfer is uh, Torres, which I'm sure there'll be questions about him as well, and the return of the Bruyne and Foden to the City team. Um, we've got Antonio, who was playing for Jamaica. I heard he came off tired in the 70th minute. I think the floor they play on is quite hard. I don't know how good that is for his hamstring. Um, you can see how all these players that are being sold and bought, there's some relevance this week that I, I bet you're the only one who really knows what's going on behind the scenes. Um, there is Gray, just uh, also 400,000. Ben Rama, 400,000. Greenwood, 300,000. Duffy, who I know was in your wildcard team, 300,000. And Regulion, uh, 300,000. Um, so just transfers out. So after Fernandez Ings, he's being transferred out. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I imagine you might not even own him, Ben, because he's quite high owned, right? Yeah, um, look, I, I do. I love, I love Danny okay. Ings, and I, and I really, um, I think he's probably up there with one of the the, the top flights, most clinical strikers. Um, but I don't own him. Uh, one, I couldn't afford him. Two, um, uh, yeah, his his ownership levels through the roof. And in three, I'm just not a fan of Villa. The, the, the data's just not there for me. And they're coming into a really the data tricky, been very poor, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, massively poor, and they're coming into a very tough run of fixtures. So it's a straight sell for me, actually, and I'll be going towards Ronaldo. But Calvert-Lewin was my initial plan, which I'm sure there'll be questions about him for you as well. Um, in terms of other Villa players on that note, so Martinez, he's the third most transferred out. It's not often you see half a million goalkeeper transfers out in game week four of an FPL season. And um, we're talking a little bit about Argentina and the potential deporting that almost happened on the pitch as well. Well, I Syndicast, think just, just a yes, quick sorry. point I'm going to make about Martinez, where we talked about official FPL and how they flag their players. They have him flagged as missing game week four as it stands at the minute through self-isolation because he was away on international duty. And there's been a change basically overnight, which just goes to show that they really don't update it that quick. And that's I think it's something we're going to touch on with Ben in terms of like Martinez when we get onto our player specific questions. I am keen to know what you think happened there, but my understanding is that the Brazilian players weren't allowed to go um by the Premier League clubs they wouldn't have had to quarantine had they gone to Brazil because they're Brazilian born. So even though they came from the UK, they're Brazilian citizens. So they would have been allowed to play. The Argentinian players would have had to quarantine and so weren't allowed to play. But if, um, if kind of, I guess, Argentina pulled out or the game got cancelled before kickoff, I was told Argentina would get the three points. But they kind of let the game go ahead. So I don't know if there's any politics involved in sports here, but 
It'd be good to get your take, Ben. And I guess the game got stopped seven minutes in, was it? And health officials came and they ran onto the pitch. Um, so to me, that kind of screams like they were almost, it's quite cynical. Like they were thinking, we'll either force them into using three early subs and play the rest of the qualifier, or they're going to forfeit and then we'll get the three points. And I've actually heard, um, you know, both teams are in the wrong here. Obviously, the Argentinian players shouldn't have lied if they did about being in the UK. But it still shows that how petty was that? Brazil knew who was starting. The lineup was out. They let them start. It seems a bit cynical to try kind of get the three points. Um, and I question, like, are they just bitter that their players didn't come and the Argentinian ones snuck away from their clubs? Is that right? Like, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors there. Um, I feel like we should just forget the transfer trends and go straight into that topic. I mean, the, look, the, the, again, we're coming to say we never really know what's been happening, what decisions have been made, um, the level of corruption in, in the highest level within FIFA. Uh, you know, if we've seen what types of things can go on at there. So, you know, within these confederations and, and, and football federations, um, nothing should surprise you anymore. Uh, with regards to, to you know what happened, it does seem a little bit strange. You know, that of course, there's, there's always two sides to the story, and the fact that I think the Argentina coach was claiming that you know he was never told that those players should never have been on the pitch. <laughs> you know, do, you know, do you believe that? And uh, it just sort of coincided where public health came out just after the, the you know the game had kicked off. I mean, people have got mobile phones. These days, uh, you know, team sheets are submitted, you know, well in advance. Um, I heard they were late. So I've just put a link in the um, channel. I don't know if it's clickable on YouTube. Um, hopefully it is. But <clears throat> it's a 28 tweet thread, Ben. And it is exactly about that. It's kind of like a organ, an organ from Brazil's health ministry. So they're the ones who kind of showed up. And apparently there was a lot of debate and different people said they can go ahead. So Brazilian authorities said it's fine. And then again, mm. apparently they then showed up at the team hotel and the players had already left. So they just missed them. Uh, then it says they were stuck in traffic on the way to the stadium. So these are the official comms that they were stuck in traffic on the way. They were debating at the stadium. By the time they decided not to go ahead, then suddenly the game was actually um, started. So they had to I mean, run onto the pitch. <clears throat> I, I mean, they do have mobile phones, right? Right. Yeah, they no, could have called them and told them to yeah, start the game, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Look, um, what do you think that means? Just straight to the chase, then about these players, because I know they would have had to quarantine for ten days on return. And <clears throat> do they return earlier now because of what's happened? And even though they are, like, don't they still therefore miss this weekend anyway? Or do they not? Like, what's the case there? Do you know much about that? <sighs> what I do know is, um, when it comes to elite level footballers in and around the Premier League. Um, there seems to be different rules for them and, and different rules for, uh, you know, the average uh, person on the street. We've seen that on occasions in the past uh, with, with previous internationals where they were given, um, you know, special, uh, you know, authorization to go out and, and play and then, and then be involved. In this instance, it doesn't look that there have been any special, um, you know, circumstances uh, afforded to those players so as far as I'm aware and concerned there will be a period of self-isolation where they must quarantine um, you know would I how long that will be for when will that be from uh, and which game weeks that will affect look I would never I, you know I would not put my mortgage on that when it goes to but what, what we'll do the Glenn though, Johnson story <laughs> No, I mean, the expectation as it stands would, would be ruled out of game week four and then a return in game week five. That's what we were led to believe. That's what we, you know, the assumption will be. And that's what it, it is currently. And that's how it stands. So, um, okay, that's really good. That's interesting. I guess we'll see things develop closer to the <clears> deadline. I'm sure if anyone here doesn't already follow you, they can get the updates as well. Um, turn on. I always have the notifications on because I feel like any injury news, like you're the first to get it. So I'm always there waiting. Um, very topical stuff, Ben. So I know you said you won't be going for Ronaldo, but let's just start going through the player specific parts now. So what do you think are his chances of starting against Newcastle? Just in terms of people had said there was only 30 minutes competitive football played apparently um, for Juventus before he came, no preseason. We, we know he played obviously in the um, international friendly. Not for yeah. any qualifier, sorry. He played, uh, he he played got, in 80 minutes. 
90 minutes, yeah. And he obviously took his shirt off and got a card for something he knowingly did that meant he doesn't have to play the qualifier midweek and was also released before this uh, game on the weekend, the friendly. So do you think that maybe the early movers who got him on wildcard and for hits, they maybe got a little bit lucky because actually with the five-day quarantine and him going to training on Wednesday, he would have missed the Newcastle game if he'd had to play the second qualifier midweek next week. So he must have knowingly taken that kind of shirt off and got the card. <laughs> part A and part B, does that mean in your opinion professionally that he is pushing for a start on Saturday? I've had this conversation today. It's a tough call. There will always be uh, opinions will be divided here. And um, for me, you know, I'm going down to it that Ronaldo will not start. That, and, that, uh, and, 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 and look, I am going against the wave of opinion with this. Um, there's one, maybe one slight caveat to that, but I'm looking at that United lineup first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And I expected Oli to go with a 4 3 3 when Varane came into that lineup. Drop the double pivot. I don't think you need it. One you got for run alongside Maguire. You know, the, the spine of that team is, is strong enough. Um, maybe, you know, Varane is definitely an upgrade on Lindelof. You get rid of Fred, Matic, McTominay, you know, whoever you want to sit in there, uh, Fred. But you, but last time out, he drops Pogba in there, which I thought was a, I thought that was a strange move, first and foremost. Um, and for me, I think United's, Best attacking front four would be Pogba on the left, Bruno on the central. You've got that place on the right, and then you've got Greenwood. Greenwood cannot be dropped. It would be an absolute travesty based on form. I don't care who who you are. Uh, it would be bad management from Oli to drop Greenwood in the short term, given what he's produced so far. So for me... Greenwood. Cavani's been there as well, right? So he didn't go on the international break and he's been training all of this couple of weeks. And that gives me a little bit of a niggling doubt and worry because I am looking to bring in Ronaldo. And I will say, even if he's on the bench and no offence to fellow Newcastle fans, as you know, it's my second team. But um, even if he comes on the 60th or 70th minute, you've got to still back him, right? Um, and especially uh, if Lukaku is out. But I'll ask you about Lukaku next. <laughs> I, I mean, look, uh, United's defensive, Newcastle's not, um, defensive data this season, I think, puts them um, in maybe uh, in the. They can't certainly... be worse than Arsenal. Second yeah, worst than Arsenal. Yeah, I think they were both second. But that's just a carryover from our, you know, the last nine games of, of last season as well. So this is this is not some kind of short term issue that needs to be addressed. It's it's something we've been aware of for for quite a long time and. We haven't been able to strengthen for whatever reason, Mike Ashley, you know, during the summer. Um, and, and and so, of course, you look at that United team, you look at how they performed on the opening weekend, Old Trafford against Leeds, uh, you know, and 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 Leeds are a, a, a better team than us. Let's not sugarcoat it. And if they can destroy uh, a Leeds team um, uh, such as that, then you fear... For Newcastle, I really do. We never seem to, you know, we never. I think there was there was an occasion where we were in two 0 at Old Trafford a, a season or two ago, and we got beat three two. And you know, we've had some home dingers in our time, but I've you know, seen guys ahead sometimes considerably, like two or three goals, and you might just then suddenly like give it up and it implode, get, like, steal a point or something. Yes, it's, it's, uh, you actually with Arsenal. I've, I've I remember one year. I think it was 2012, maybe Christmas that year. And I don't know if you remember this. It's maybe around Boxing Day, and I was in Peru in Lima at the time. And I think it was like the five uh, seven or like the four four. Oh, was it the World Cup Hat Trick? I think it, it was, was the World Hat Trick. The one where he ran past people, fell over, got up. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. How could I forget? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Now you know how I feel. Last week yeah. I was being laughed at by Mariner, and he kept pulling up these stats tables and just he kept saying Arsenal, and then he had this evil villain laugh, and I was like, Mu-ha-ha. and I was just <laughs> sitting there, and I feel like I've put you through the same thing. I'm so sorry. I just want to ask you something about Leeds, Ben, um, before we go on to Firmino and a little bit more about Liverpool, actually, because it seems like a nice segue. So I had Salah as my boss team captain. 
I haven't done my transfers yet. He's still my captain. Um, I have Ings and Bruno. They're the two I'd be considering to turn into Ronaldo and maybe Jota. So the Firmino injury, that is a question for me. Um, but secondly, even if Ronaldo kind of doesn't start, as I was saying, I think Newcastle defensively, the stats are there to show me that even off the bench, I've seen the likes of Ober, Greenwood and other players get braces off the bench. I, I'm willing to just put Ronaldo in from now. I like the captaincy for the two home fixtures this week and the I think there's not game week five, but game week six as well. He has a great home week, uh, home game. By then, I would look to move to Lukaku, I reckon, in game week seven, when Chelsea have an incredible swing of fixtures. I think Leeds at home, if we look at data specifically, they're actually quite good. Um, I know they're very bad away defensively. But at home, I, I do back Leeds more. And I think the likes of Phillips are back. They've been playing well in the kind of qualifiers. And I, I'm not sure that Liverpool is going to slap them up away as much as people think. And my two questions for you are kind of, have you noticed already, just in three weeks, a difference in home and away advantage now that fans are back compared to, say, last season with the pandemic? And secondly, I know you don't want Ronaldo, but do you believe that he could score against Newcastle even off the bench? Um, I mean, I'll address the first question with regards to, to sort of this season and last. And I, um, uh, there was a stat that I looked at at the beginning of the season, and I think there was something like uh, Liverpool was a great example, I think. Um, there was a, a downturn in, in, in points by 38% um, from from uh, their home form when when supporters were there and supporters you know were absent from Anfield and obviously they went on that was it that 68 game unbeaten unbeaten home? run at home and then they lost like five or they didn't win yeah. for like seven games or yeah something. um and and look so I think there's the the gulf between you know the home performances this season already and and last is 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 huge you can say that just in terms of and especially during these early weeks where you know it's new you have that again you have that that buzz of the crowd and almost that opening weekend i made the comment on the first two weekends when when teams were experiencing their their first home matches in front of supporters for for such a long time almost the result was was irrelevant um you know, supporters were just happy to be there. And regardless of what was happening on the pitch, they were behind the team. The, the atmosphere was electric. Uh, in a, you know, but we've seen the returns and the number of home wins just in those, you know, those, those game week one and game week two. And when you compare that to last season, uh, I think it was, and I, I may be wrong, but I'm sure there was only maybe two, two home wins on the opening game, maybe last season. And I think that was maybe seven, seven or potentially eight this year um you know I, I may have those numbers slightly off but there was a there was a big disparity between the two so i think you know that in itself is is, is, is evident uh and secondly with regards to cristiano look the guy is an absolute beast <laughs> there's no they know that there's no getting away from it uh he's capable of of creating something scoring something returning points whether he's on pitch for one minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, ninety minutes, um, and against Newcastle, look, anything could happen. He could score a hat trick from the bench, Ronaldo. Um, he defies his, his year. He's got a he's got a point to prove. You know, there will be doubters. There will be people questioning this. Can this Ronaldo do it at thirty six years of age in the Premier League? You know, returning. Um, and that will drive him, that will motivate him to, to prove these doubters wrong. Ronaldo is always looking for something to drive him, to improve him, to make sure he's the best that he's, you know, his, his body will allow him to be. And, and that will be it first and foremost. The last thing he wants, he, you know, he doesn't want um, this return to Old Trafford to, in any way, shape or form, um, you know, muddy, is his first spell at United. Mm. He wants to go out on a high. He wants to win trophies. Um, you know, he's a uh, he's just an anomaly. Him and Messi um, are just freaks, freaks of the sport. And I think he'll be an absolutely a, a huge success this season. I really I, do. I mean, that's incredible to hear because everyone I've seen who's given a kind of reason why they don't have Ronaldo in FPL this week, whatever the reason may be. And whoever they are, um, it's always been that 
I'm not getting them for my team or for my team structure, or I'm going to get them maybe if they perform well after a few weeks. Maybe they're willing to wait. They think like you that he won't start. But overall, they all kind of buy this idea that he's 36. He's going to be 37 by the end of the season. He's come to the most physically demanding league. He doesn't want to muddy his first year, as you say. He seems to be here to want to win, and he's an elite specimen of an athlete, as we know. Um, so it is crazy. What I want to do is, so Ben, we have quite a lot of live viewers. We were just over 60 a second ago. And what I'm going to do is, before we move on to talking about Firmino, which Hibbo will ask you and Calvert-Lewin, and then we'll open up to the floor. I think there's some stuff about Wilson as well recently. Those three key players and some live Q&A, because I know we're conscious of time. I want to give you some time with the guests as well. Um, I'm going to just say, guys, please, if you are new to the channel, do hit like. When we get to the right number of likes, I will let you do the live Q&A with Ben. Otherwise, I'm just going to ask him the stuff me and Hibbo want to know. And you guys are just going to have to watch along because I forgot to put the smash like or get out ticker in the background while you sort yourselves out and get those likes in. I'm going to play a video for you, Ben, if you've not seen. It's one of those funny clips I told you about. So uh, Tom Stevenson, number two Hall of Fame, came onto the show as our first guest. And one minute in, I tried to kind of be very good friends with him. I said, like, you know, you're the fifth member of the crew. There's four hosts right now. And I was met with a tumbleweed moment. So for some self-deprecating humor, I think you might <laughs> laugh when you see this clip. But I'm going to try and find something like this about Hibbo this season. But just enjoy, guys, if you're new. And hit like <laughs> while you watch me embarrass myself if the rest of the content wasn't enough for you. Definitely our most popular member of the Net That Whole crew. And you can definitely be our fifth crewmate now going forward. <laughs> Definitely be our fifth crewmate now going forward. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old so just while we're here as well guys so please do continue so please do continue to hit like and subscribe <laughs> as i was saying in that highly embarrassing clip um so just on that note as well i see the likes went up very quickly ben so very happy about that um we're at 34 now there is a dislike for me asking but to be fair ben every week there's a dislike i think it's the same guy they come back in the hour mark and we appreciate your support it means a lot that you come back every week <laughs> <laughs> must be doing something right. So on that note, I'll hand over to you, but I think there's a few more interesting players we want to let the guys in the audience know about before we open yeah, up. Yeah, so there, there's obviously players of fantasy interest that they have injuries and stuff, and I, I would like to kind of rattle through them as quickly as I could, really. Like, But a name on everybody's lips at the minute is Firmino. So like he was subbed off in the last game. It wasn't actually apparent straight away that he was injured. I kind of thought it was tactical at first. And Liverpool have been very quiet in this. Now, in terms of fantasy, it would open the door for Giada. So, like, what do you know about Firmino? Is there any time frame? Because I know they were talking about a second scan. And um, So, first and foremost, it was hamstring. Right. Um, and uh, Firmino's a fairly robust player. Tolerate the demands of the game. He's not a player that, that tends to come off very often, particularly with soft tissue or, or, or muscle injuries. So, there was certainly something in there enough, you know, to, to flag it to the manager um it looked to be more of a precautionary measure certainly that initial scan came back and it was it was fairly positive um it's it wasn't as serious as, as what they initially thought now the thing the difficulty is with hamstring injuries um they have very high re-injury recurrence rates so these are injuries that have to be tread really really carefully with kid gloves um what i would say is you know when you have somebody like Diego Yota in, in the Liverpool team and, and Marnie and, and Salah, um, if somebody like Firmino, who's coming off the back of a hamstring injury, is there or thereabouts, but why would you risk him? So this is one of those where, you know, inherently you have a potential player who, who could play, who could be involved, but because Klopp may have other options who are fully fit and in good form, by the way, True. then yeah. why take that risk and potentially exacerbate any problem? And all of a sudden, you've got an injury that's maybe 10 to 14 days to maybe four to six weeks. So yeah. unless they're 100% and, you know, it's that could be difficult within that time frame, even at this point, you know, what you want to be seeing, you want to be seeing Roberto Firmino involved in full training and taking part with the group from certainly Wednesday, Thursday would be a good sign. But even by then, I say there are absolutely no guarantees because it could be that players are coming through the sessions and they may have a reaction overnight. So, you know, it's impossible to give any kind of definitive answer on that. But what we do know, not as bad as initially thought. So, you know, if it certainly hopefully should be short term. 
no problem. I just want to touch on, say, Dominic Calvert-Lewin because we know he's kind of had this ongoing toe problem. Now there's talk about a thigh strain. What can you tell us about that, really? Because I know he's fairly, fairly popular in FPL terms at the moment. Yeah, so the toe injury itself was picked up um, post Euros, involved uh, when he came back to train, and and that so there's there's two um, I suppose facets to consider to this this injury first and foremost. One, it's restricted his training, so he's not able to to train fully, and he's not able to play ninety minutes, um, and that's due to his uh, involvement at the Euros his late return, and he's just, you know, he's not firing at all cylinders, as it were. He's not fully match fit. He hasn't got the sharpness. So the the, the the thigh injury, one, it potentially fatigue-related because, he, like I say, he's not getting that that low dose minutes in his legs post-Euros and, you know, not getting those sessions in through the week. And secondly, because of his toe, they may be altering his gait, is slight, you know, he may be making allowances, slight changes in the way he runs and sprints, uh, whether that be sort of consciously or subconsciously. So that would put additional strain on different muscles within the body. So that's potentially what's happened in this instance. And again, what we do know, it's a slight strain, but with it's a quadriceps muscle. And of course, the, the, the quadriceps muscle, um, whereas the hamstrings for sprinting, quick change, you know, explosiveness. The quadriceps is is primarily, um, you know, used for kicking motion. So again, it's an injury that can be exacerbated fairly easy and it needs to be tread, you know, conservatively and well. But as it stands, what we do know, again, it's doesn't look to be too severe. It's slight and typically within a 10 to 14 day period for those mild strains or a little bit of tightness, 10 to 14 days is normally you know, good enough to, to see a potential in a, a return on players be to clear to play. So fingers crossed, Dominic Calvert Lewin, you know, may have a chance of returning in game week four. That is interesting. I was okay. actually looking to do Ings to Calvert Lewin before I knew Ronaldo was signing. And although I've hyped up Ronaldo and banged his drum a lot, there's no reason why I wouldn't maybe take a minus four and get Ronaldo, Calvert Lewin and Jota all at once in one fell swoop with three moves mm. little mini wild card there so i am in, interested by that but i think tony could do okay um i want to ask you a little bit about lukaku actually so this was an interesting one um again obviously in some ways it's good news because he's going back to chelsea sooner but he kind of himself mentioned he's getting a little scan and it's for an ongoing problem like i can't imagine he would play two games at such intensity um if it was too serious but what are your thoughts on that? Like, is there any worries? Should people who own Lukaku get jittery knees yet? Is there? Um, I mean, it's 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 well, obviously very early in the season, and uh, his fitness probably would have been impacted again by the Euros, his late return, and you know, research will tell us, um, you know, the more hours you put in on the training pitches, the more robust you are, and the more able you are able to tolerate the demands of the game. Those who have less, they become an increased risk of injury incidents. Um, and what we also know is players rarely go out on that pitch and they feel 100%. Players are carrying knocks, niggles, minor strains and issues. So in that respect, that's, you know, it's good news that you know, Lukaku has been carrying this, this niggling little problem, but he has been able to play through it. What we don't know at the time of recording is whether that issue has been exacerbated in any way, shape, or form. So again, it's 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 the thigh muscle. Um, and just in terms of especially with Lukaku, and and we talk about how injuries may affect different players. Lukaku, very explosive, powerful, and Michael Antonio, for example, these players tend to be more susceptible to um, you know, hamstring injuries and, and, and so on and so forth, because just of the very nature of how they play the game on the very edge. You know, uh, there's not a lot of change happened over over the years in terms of how much distance a player may cover in a game, 10, 11, 12 kilometres. What has changed is the number of high intensity sprints that a player may or is expected to perform within the game with either little or no rest between those and Lukaku certainly falls into that category so it's something that you know you need to be aware of it needs to be something that's you know um monitored and the worry would be is if 
if that problem has you know worsened with his involvement with Belgium. If it's just a precautionary issue and he's just getting a check to make sure that things haven't got any worse, then you know Lukaku will be doing you know like all players. You know, they will want to be out there and they want to play, especially, you know, having just returned to the club again. He'll be a, a player that feels he's got something to prove and, and he want to, to ensure that, you know, this this price tag that he's arrived with, you know, that he's uh, he proved himself to be value for money. Just a quick one from another friend of the show. So um, I think it's at FPL Negan, Chris Irvine. He, he makes the point about the Champions League games. Obviously, so far in the first three game weeks, we've not had to contend with these. I think it's probably a similar question for Man City lineups as well, right? About whether Torres will play centre forward and is De Bruyne coming back a risk? Um, I think De Bruyne playing a false nine is more of a risk of happening than Foden. I think I saw some data earlier where Foden plays left wing predominantly. So I don't think he'll be threatening Torres for centre forward. But there is Jesus, there is De Bruyne out of position. Um, with that in mind, like would Lukaku be risked against Villa, a game that might be quite easy, I guess, especially when Martinez is out and I don't know about Conser and Ming status. Um, when there is Champions League midweek. So what do you think about these clubs, like the Chelsea's and Cities of the world, where they have deep squads, I suppose, and they do have important Champions League games coming up? Like, are they likely to rest him if that niggle is worse than feared and just protect well, him to then use him <clears throat> for Champions League, I guess? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a rotation risk there. And I go back to the point that I made made earlier uh, with Jurgen Klopp and, and Jota and Firmino. If you look at that Chelsea squad and potentially, yeah, look, the team of Werner, Kai Havertz, they're, they're not the same ilk and the same quality as a Lukaku. But are these guys good enough to be deployed as a centre-forward, as a striker for a one-off game against a struggling Villa team who are you know missing at least, you know, well, Martinez, we think, and uh, Buendia, uh, we know Tyrone Mings has had a had a recent rib problem. Um, we Konza, I think, picked up a, a, a knee injury as well. So you look at that in a game. It's about interpreting the information to hand and thinking. Right. Well, actually, what do we know about Thomas Tuchel? Thomas Tuchel is inherently what we've seen. He's not a guy that takes unnecessary risks. Uh, we've seen that with Ben Chilwell. Ben Chilwell, zero minutes. This Strange, season. I was nervous. Yes, that comes off the back of obviously great performances from Marcus Alonso and being out there. But we're also talking about a guy that had, um, yes, he was involved in the Euros, but he wasn't playing minutes for England. So he was on. And when you talk about players are training with the national team and they're playing, they're not training. Uh, you know, ultimately, once you get a pre season out of the way, if you're not playing in that first team regularly, Inherently, it could be that your players are becoming increasingly deconditioned as they go into the season, but just because, like I say, if teams are playing two, three games a week, when are you actually getting the opportunities to go through and, and fulfil those intensive sessions on the training pitches? You're not. You're, you're either recovering or you're preparing. So it's post-match recovery strategies and, and, and pre-match you know, preparation. So it's, you know, you may put them with the under 23s or bounce games or behind closed doors. Nothing can replicate the demands of the Premier League. So, you know, going back to the point, Tuchel doesn't strike me as a manager that will, you know, put a player at risk unnecessarily. And with the players at his disposal, then he certainly doesn't need to do that, particularly in one-off games and particularly with maybe a Champions League fixture coming up. Um, you know, I think Chelsea would have more than enough. Am I right in thinking it's a game at Zenit? Yeah, they play Zenit at home. Yeah, so if, you know, do I think Chelsea have more than enough to dispatch Villa and Zenit in the same game week without a Romelu Lukaku? Without question. And is that a decision that Thomas Tuchel would make based on the fact that, you know, potentially... If there's a niggling problem there that could, you know, could exacerbate and put him out for two, three, four weeks, then you know, is he is he mm. uh, brave enough to make that call? One hundred percent. Better to take the precaution, I think, as you say, and not risk them and have them out longer term, um, which I've seen many a time with Arsenal players and the likes of Wilshere and Diaby and people who they themselves wanted to rush back. I guess for a lot of the viewers who are here now and weren't here earlier. 
you did mention that obviously um it's not necessarily what the medical team wants always that happens so you have scenarios where managers will start a player even though the player says they're not ready or a player will want to start even though the medical team and manager don't want them to start but they're the talisman of their team so in the same vein that Ronaldo arriving is probably Ole's boss, I'm sure there's scenarios like that in other teams. So, I mean, I mean, what what I'd add, and I suppose expand upon that, decisions with regards to return to play tend to be player led. So there will be discussions, consultations with stakeholders, medical teams, backroom staff, coach, and the players. And you know, medical team will put a a, a point of view forward. Players will make an informed decision, and those who um, you know will say, well, look. And understand what the risks are and know that potentially I'm, you know, in the red zone. Do I want to be involved? Do I want to play in the Champions League? Do I want to play and you know in front of a packed, you know, uh, you know, Old Trafford crowd? Of course I do. Is the manager under pressure? Does he need the result? Maybe so. Is he getting pressure from stakeholders to say, I want my best players on the pitch? The owner, even, for example, as you were saying. Yeah, even a 70 or 80 percent fit Harry Kane is better than most strikers in the world. So if he's getting anywhere near towards where it should be, do we start Harry Kane? Yeah, yes, we do. So We have some questions about Man United, actually. I don't know, Hibbo, if you want to talk about Sancho, but from the live chat, just to read it out for the podcast listeners, they're saying on the flip side, uh, Man United don't have a very tough Champions League group, um, unlike the other two. And is that something that will then impact him? Because... You know, like, wh- does Ronaldo play both? Does he play against Newcastle and in the Champions League and then the following weekend? Like, three games in seven days? I think he did it for Juve when he was fit, but does he do is that it... with one international game in 30 minutes for Juve this season only so far? Um, I mean, Cristiano's a, uh, you know, he's a an elite athlete. And yes, he might have, you know, he might have 36 years of age and, you know, caught his, his date of birth. But in terms of his actual physical body and, and where he's at you know you, you could argue that he's 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 fit and healthy as a as a 27 as a 28 year old and could he play you know three games in a week yes of course he could without question do i That's think very Ollie reassuring will... by the way <laughs> um but do i do i think ollie will uh, and i go back and i there's question marks over Jaden sancho that's that's the one for me if Sancho wasn't fit, then I see maybe an easy switch or an easy move. If he is fully fit, I, I look. I'm looking at Pogba. I think Pogba's going to go on the left. I really do. Bruno's starting centrally. You've got that slot on the right, Sancho, and then you've got Greenwood. And if you haven't got Sancho in, you could put Greenwood on the right, and then you could start Cavani. Yeah. Uh, I just think. The, the suspension has worked in United's favour with Ronaldo, but even, look, uh, uh, it's going to divide opinion. Look, I just I just try to look at the, I try not to be influenced maybe by the fact that it's Ronaldo and it's... The narrative of him coming home. and Because um, he uh, could come on in the 60th minute to a standing ovation, right? Like, there's no reason why he has to start. He could what, get 30 minutes, play the Champions League and start the following Premier League game. I mean, what, I suppose what, what message does that send to the rest of the squad that Oli says, right, I tell you what, it doesn't matter how well you've played, say a Greenwood, who started the season fantastically, you know, to say, well, I tell you what, Mason... Uh, you're out this weekend because uh, I'm sticking Cristiano straight in there. You know, it, it's yeah, he's not going to be happy. It's going to be a lot of unease in that dressing room. People they are going to almost get their backs up with you know who's a superstar coming in and does it matter what I do on the pitch because I'm going to be out of the team. Uh, I think minutes on Saturday start in the Champions League. See where we are after that. that that's, so are that's... you saying I should get Calvin Lewin? Um, so, so anyone <laughs> watching this, uh, Ben has promised Calvin Lewin starts and scores a brace. <laughs> oh, so, he hates the thing. No, 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 no. So should I do one move, Ings to Calvin Lewin, save my free transfer, the patient manager that I am, and have two free transfers in game week five again, um, and just wait out this uh, Ronaldo potential non-starter? Or do I go kind of all in and? 
get Ronaldo and captain him because that's where I'm leaning at the moment. Well, it's Monday we're recording, isn't it? So it is too it, early, yeah. As it as it stands, I would I would I would back Calvert Lewin to start. Okay, um, but we've got to so, wait and see more. Uh, yeah, but as with anything, as as I always say when it comes to injuries and poor, leave it as long as you possibly can. Um, even if you know, don't be swayed by maybe shots that you may see from the training ground. It's only a, a snippet of, of one. You know, you don't even know what it is half of the it might time. Be individual training sometimes, right? They're not even with the squad. And you don't even, yeah. I mean, we've seen it with um, who was it? Andy Robertson. You know, it, it was a picture of him. You know, just uh, it's not Melwood anymore. Wherever the new training ground is, and um, and it was just like. It doesn't actually show you anything. Van Dijk, for about four months, people had Van Dijk penciled in for a return because they've seen him kicking a ball around the training pitch. You know, there, there wasn't any change in direction. There weren't any high-intensity drills there. Um, you're seeing exactly what either the player or the club uh, want you to see. They saw PR at the end of the day. So yeah. just going into the live Q&A, because I promised you that one hour 45 was the longest and we aim for one hour 30. We're at one hour 40. You've done us a great service being here. So I don't want to keep it too long. So let's go to the guest Q&A for the next five minutes. Um, we're going to alternate these quick fire. The first one is not really a fantasy one or a football one or an injury one. So all three of us will answer this, but then we'll alternate going forward. So Pete Gray asks, is there any better pint than Guinness? Um, what do you think, Ben? I'll let Hibbo give his say, but... Controversial. I'm not a. I'm not a, a straight up Guinness drinker. Uh, I, the nearest I get to drinking Guinness would be as part of a black velvet, and a black velvet is uh, a very, very, very nice paint. And maybe there is no better paint than a than a black velvet. I have to try out a black velvet. What's it made of? <laughs> it's half a cider, half a Guinness mixed. Really? So it's like a snake bite, but with um, yeah. So you obviously be... Guinness instead of lager. Yeah, so you take you take a little bit of the gas out of the of the cider. Uh, I like sweet, so I like a woodpecker. Um, take the gas. Otherwise, the, the two don't mix. And then yeah, then you put the Guinness in. Absolutely tremendous. We used to make. I used to make a drink when I worked in a bar, and it was a half a pint of Guinness, and you dropped on a shot of Jameson. It was called an Irish Cure Bomb. So you should you should you should try that out. No, but there's there's no bit for me. There's no better pint than a pint of Guinness. It's just the best, I think. Um, just to touch on the question on the screen now, so from FPL Dallas, he's saying, wouldn't Ole just bench Sancho for Greenwood if it's based on performance and then start Ronaldo as a striker? I think we've kind of covered that, but just to touch on it again. Just a quick fire answer this time, yeah. Uh, possibly, um, but I think Sancho, I think, was that his first start? And I think, you know, he deserves more than just, you know, he's coming into a new club, big price tag. And again, he needs to show a little bit of belief and, you know, give his players a little bit of confidence. He might knock his confidence, right, if he just suddenly benches him. Yeah, but but of course, you know, he, he is carrying that little niggle that's um, kept him out of the, the England game. So um, we will see. Wait and see. Okay, so this one's from We Go To Runner. Uh, will Lukaku be fine this week? Let's hope so. I mean, if it's just a precautionary measure, it's nothing um, different from, from what he's been managing and playing with, then, you know, yeah, I don't see any issues there. But, you know, given what we discussed before, Tuchel does have other options at his disposal. So just because he is fine, you know, doesn't necessarily mean he's going to play. Sorry, I just, um, I'm having internet issues. We've done three streams for the first time in a week. We did Tuesday, Friday, Monday. So that's a milestone, but my internet seems to be iffy. I think I had to contact BTM. I'll, this one, um, I'll let you read this one, but I don't actually know if this player is yeah. a real player. I've just I put it up. No, I'm not. I'm not reading that out. <laughs> okay, I, 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 what, in terms of what you see, like um, obviously you know more of the obscure players and fringe players than us. Like, is this a troll or is it worth reading out, uh, Ben? Is it you don't know this player? This this is a hundred percent a troll. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, yeah, if you yeah. <laughs> this is the Pass. issue of live chat, and when I've had too much uh, red wine. <laughs> so just just a quick question from Pete Gray. He's asking us: Chilwell carrying an injury? I know we touched on the fact that. It's maybe a case of like a lack of kind of match sharpness. Would that be correct? Yeah, and, and it is just exactly that in the course of performances of, of, of Marcus Alonso. So yeah. post Euros didn't do a lot over the summer um, and, and just bade his time. 
Yeah, so I've got one more from Ram and Nathan. Um, any updates on Kante's injury? Uh, ankle injury, uh, again, nothing too serious. The worry with Kante is always that he's going to pick up the, with a hamstring problem, um, but it's not that. Uh, it, it was obviously serious enough to force him off at Anfield, but but again, you know, we're looking at that Chelsea midfield, Kovacic and Jorginho, um, he's, he's is a big part of that, but, you know... Um, Tuchel has strength and depth in that department, and and will not be risked. But certainly nothing to indicate that it's that it's long term. Okay, um, we we got so just I see driving into it. I'll let Hibo. Why don't you put the questions up? Because mine is like lagging and it's been yeah, on and yeah, off. No problem. Um, I just realised the name of the last question. Yeah, very, Rafinha. Very <laughs> Rafinha status for the Liverpool game. So I don't think he travelled to Brazil, did he? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, and it's always difficult during the international break, but I have um, Rafinha as being absolutely fine. I'm not certainly not aware of any issues at this moment, so I would fully expect him to be involved in game week four. What's your uh, favourite away ground, Ben, from Blue Mix? Uh, favourite away ground? Oh, do you know what? I have to go back to uh, Filbert Street, uh, Leicester, when... Uh, I mean, oh God, I don't even recall what year, but Newcastle, we had to go there and get a result. Otherwise, we would have went down to the old Division 3. Um, and we went and we, we won 2-1. I think Gavin Peacock scored late in the game, maybe time added on. Um, and they placed the way and just went absolutely ballistic. And it just, it just stuck. It stuck in my mind. Um, and it was like a proper stadium. I mean, what we we were getting pelted with coins. I mean, I was only young. They were spitting on us. They were trying to jump over the fence to attack. <laughs> where, um, but nothing could take the shine off the fact that we we got three points and we we stayed up. And then we built on that, and we had the you know the entertainers followed on its uh, you know off the back of that survival season. A spree, yeah. Yeah. So we have Gabriel, who's one of our co-hosts of the show, actually, um, Ben, and he's wondering if you can give an assessment of how Jimenez is feeling in his role. And obviously, he's come back from quite a severe injury, like similar to what ended Ryan Mason's career. And I think it's incredible he's even playing football so soon after the, I guess he had brain surgery, you could say. Yeah, I mean, it's so obviously, uh, suffered a fractured skull. Um, but from for conversations that I've had with people in and around the club, um, the, the Wolves medical team have been very impressed with him and as in fact they've actually had to hold him back um he's been you know itching to get back on that pitch for a long time before they allowed him to do so there were obviously concerns um yes the physic you know the physical aspect of how he would cope but also the psychological aspect but again people who were close to the players just said that he's almost carrying on and playing as if you know it's 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 not an issue um they gradually worked with them on the training pitches. You know, they started off heading sponge balls and and gradually built up the weight of the football. So he's heading it regularly, and he's confident. He's going out there and he's he's getting himself in good positions. Um, I think he's he's had joint second most shots in the opponent's box. I think his uh, XA is about zero point six nine. Uh, his highest number of key passes. So he's doing it right. He just needs that. Maybe it's that little bit of luck. And Wolves have some a little bit of a fixture swing themselves, a little bit of easing of the, you know, playing some teams in and around them. And I, I really do like Jimenez. I think he's, he's the focal point of that Wolves attack. And, and of course, with Triori back, you know, he's he's partner. I think the two of them could could light up Wolves. And I wouldn't be surprised if they get a, a couple of decent results under the bend. They've, you know, they've they've been underperforming their data, not as bad as it suggests. One one of the friends of the show, Chris Irvine, left a message in the the, the comments. They say your trip to Fulbright Street sounded like a typical Saturday in an Irish League match. Now, <laughs> I've been to Lumfield at Windsor Park, and I've been to as beloved Glen Torrance, so I can testify to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just um, we'll let you go, Miss. I just want to quickly give very quick answers to somebody. So we have covered most of the questions that I'm skipping. So stuff around kind of Calvert Lewin and Lukaku, and um, we will timestamp those in the video on demand in case anyone missed those. Um, one that hasn't been mentioned, I don't think it matters to many people, but I can even answer this as your mini apprentice, Ben. So how long will Ben White be out? He's not. He just featured in a behind-closed-doors uh, friendly with Brentford. Him and Gabriel partnered each other. 
it looks like Arsenal's first choice kind of centre back pairing is going to start against Norwich on Saturday. I hope so. I've bought tickets to the Emirates. Um, it hopefully won't be as bad as the Chelsea game I went to watch live. Um, that that was definitely a very disappointing day. Um, as nice as it was to be back at a stadium after eighteen months. Um, stop, you do stop, not wasting, wanna... stop wasting your money. It's a glutton for punishment. I call myself. Um, <laughs> Luckily, this one's only like 30-odd quid, so this is much cheaper than the Category A games. Um, just on Wilson, um, because I'm not sure if we did cover him at all, but just as a final kind of question for the night. So I thought he was fine. He has great-looking fixtures coming up. He's the main man. We know he's on penalties. It sounds like he may potentially now be out for a couple of weeks. Is that right, or is that quite speculative still and early? I have seen those headlines, and I have seen some suggestion that he's maybe out for, for some time. Not, not to my knowledge and not how I understand the actual problem. Uh, again, we're talking about hamstring issues with Callum Wilson, and, and fortunately, that wasn't the case um, last time out. It was actually a problem with his quad, and it's, he, he felt that problem early on in the game. I think he had a little bit of treatment 10th, 11th, 12th minute, uh, but he was able to manage that. Uh, got through the half-time and said he wanted to stay on and, and help the team, and he felt that he was, he was good for a goal. That game, that you know, that never transpired. But again, that's an indication of, of maybe the level of, uh, or, you know, maybe the the severity of the problem or, or not, as the case may be. You know, the only concern again is what's happened maybe since then, if there has been any kind of setback. But I'm not aware of anything, and it was mainly there was a. You know, he was getting checked and scanned, but you know, he played on for almost I think 60 minutes from that initial problem. So, you know, unless there was there was any reason um that that problem was made significantly worse than than Callum would be a player that I would expect to see at Old Trafford. Sounds good. Um, I guess Ben, just to kind of get us out of here, I'm gonna play a short clip um just explaining about the FCA awards and how people can vote. But before we leave the show. Where can, I guess, viewers or any of the podcast listeners who are watching this afterwards find you? Can you give them just a bit of info about both, I guess, your personal account, but also Premier Injuries? Yeah, so I run the um, premierinjuries.com website uh, where we're going over a major overhaul. So hopefully we'll have lots of new content and lots of new stuff on there within maybe the next 7, 10, 14 days. But for now, predominantly we're an injury table where you can go to find out about players, potential return to play, and gives you a little bit of insight in and around those injuries. We also produce a lot of content on YouTube, which is Premier Injuries. We look at it, you know, it, the wider circle. So we do have deadline uh, live Q&As where we talk about availability and injuries, but we discuss things around um, captaincies. We look at players to watch, um, dream team picks, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then finally, most people will find me uh, on social media via Twitter, and that is at Ben Dinnery, where I seem to spend most of my life. I try to respond to as many questions as humanly possible um if i miss one or two i apologize but i do read the majority so i do go through stuff um and and yes so if you have any questions please feel free to fail it away and if you have no questions guys but you just want to appreciate ben for the time he's taken today do drop him a tweet as he says he will read them all and i think he'll appreciate um any support for tonight so thank you ben for joining us hopefully um when we find something interesting in the coming season, we can do another kind of collab together, I'm sure. Um, there's definitely the fan team connection. We're all avid players and we all work with Hub. Um, I did see you do some of those live Q&As you mentioned actually one time, I think, on The Athletic with Mark, another friend of the show. So FPL General, I know you guys are quite close. So it sounds like maybe we can do an interesting uh, get together at some point or some kind of live stream again. But for anyone who's here, thank you so much for watching. Uh, it's been a quite a large number of you towards the end who've been here and we peaked at about over 70 live viewers concurrently so really happy to have you with us um if you're new to the channel subscribe hit like we're almost at 50 likes at the time of recording so get us to 50 i will appreciate that and the pikachu onesie will come out again which that's <laughs> another story for another day ben i'll, I'll send you many of these advice, <laughs> don't worry. um before i get us out of here um Hibo, is there anything you want to say while i just load up the no final? no it was, it was brilliant to meet you ben yeah, yeah, pleasure, guys. I enjoyed it. Thank you. I'll just play this clip, Ben, and then we'll stay back quickly. And once I end the broadcast, and we'll just uh, say bye to you. But um, this is an FCA uh, one minute for anyone who doesn't know how to vote. Voting ends on September 12th. Help us in this David and Goliath story uh, 1K subs versus 200K subs. So. 
we are definitely the minnows. Hey everybody, Mariner here. Um, just to let you know that Net That Hall have been nominated in the Football Content Awards 2021 for Best in Fantasy Football slash Video. It's quite an amazing feat for us because we've only been going since game week 20 of last season. And I think it's fair to describe our competition as pretty big and us as minnows, if you're thinking about this as an FA Cup match. But, you know, there are giant killing acts and little old Net That Hall and our amazing haulers punch massively above our weight, don't we? So with a bit of help from you, who knows what we might achieve? So let's quickly walk through um, what um, and how to vote. OK, so first of all, head across to the footballcontentawards.com slash voting. And what you'll see within that page is if you head down, you'll see the fantasy football section, which is about halfway down. You see the podcasts, you see the videos, you hit net that hole. And with respect to editorials, let's not forget our all about FPL friends who were who also nominated as well. So what are you waiting for? Give us a vote and thank you very much indeed.